Welcome. In this video, we'll show you what aquatic hitchhikers you should be concerned with and how you can help prevent their spread and what procedures you can use to prevent transporting these hitchhikers to another body of water. These aquatic nuisance species can hitch a ride on our clothing, dock lines, seaplane hulls, and floats. And when we go to another lake or stream, the nuisance species can be released. And if the conditions are right, they can become established and create drastic results. I'm Steve McCoy, the Executive Director of the Seaplane Pilots Association. This video is a joint project of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association and the Seaplane Pilots Association. It has been built on the considerable efforts of the 100th Meridian Initiative, the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the Aquatic Nuisance Task Force. These organizations have provided much of the video we will show you in a moment, and we would like to thank them for all of their hard work. After you watch the video, we'll review the aquatic plants and animals that we want to avoid taking along as hitchhikers, and we'll review the simple but effective methods shown to eliminate these hitchhikers. And yes, there will be a test, but we'll provide you with sources of information about aquatic invasive species in your state and show you how you can include invasives into your flight planning process. Once you have successfully completed the exam, you can print a certificate to carry with you in your seaplane as evidence that you have been properly trained in the procedures to avoid transporting these aquatic invasive species. So let's get started. Every day, hundreds of seaplanes take off and land on waterways across North America. And while most of these flights present little risk of spreading aquatic nuisance species, it's difficult for most pilots to determine their risk level without extensive local knowledge. That's why federal, state, tribal, and local agencies responsible for protecting public water resources like drinking, irrigation, and industrial water supplies, recreation, power production, fish and wildlife habitat, and cultural values have teamed up with the National Seaplane Pilots Association to produce this education and training video on how to inspect and clean your aircraft before every flight. Seaplanes, including commercial air carriers, like other forms of watercraft and water-based equipment, can spread aquatic nuisance species, including zebra and quagga mussels, invasive plants, and other ANS from one water body to another. They do this by attaching to the external surfaces of floats, cables, and rudders, and also internally when raw water seeps into floats, hulls, and holes where tiny mussels or other ANS larvae or spores are present. They are then released when water is pumped out or otherwise discharged into a different waterway. Seaplane pilots are a very environmentally aware group and the membership of the National Seaplane Pilots Association will do everything required to protect the nation's waterways and prevent them from becoming clogged with invasive species like Dracaenid mussels, Eurasian water milfoil, or Brazilian elodea. These species can cut off water supplies vital to individuals, businesses, and farmers, devastate recreational boating and fishing, interfere with power production and shipping, limit seaplane access, and ruin the ecology for future generations. Like recreational boaters, commercial boat transport businesses, and those who move water-based equipment, seaplane pilots also need to be aware of the risk their activity can have on the ecology and economy of a region. Before leaving any water body, adding these simple steps to your pre-flight routine can reduce or eliminate those risks. Inspect and remove all attached vegetation from every part of the aircraft, including floats, rudders, cables, lines, and cross members. Inspect all submerged surfaces of the aircraft visually and by running your hand along any surfaces that appear dirty. And then, with a long-handled brush, remove any surface deposits that could mask the presence of attached juvenile mussels. Aquatic vegetation can carry zebra and quagga mussels and other invasive species. Many aquatic plants are themselves highly invasive. These species are often spread when they become attached to or entrained in seaplanes, 
and are then spread from one water body to another. So it's vitally important that all visible plants and plant fragments be removed before takeoff. Attached mussels and their waterborne larvae are capable of surviving on board for several days and establishing a new population when inadvertently released into a new water body. The idea is removing any bits or pieces of the aquatic vegetation. You can take and you can just use your brush make sure that you're cleaning everything down and you can actually get down below the water line with it as well. Just want to make sure there's no fragments left on that. So give you that back. Then we're going to go down here. I'm going to show you about our dock, dock lines and how they can handle okay. stuff. If you take a look on your dock lines, the way you've got them rigged up here, you can also have vegetation that'll hook under, under those. So one of the things that you want to do is make sure before you take off, you check your dock lines. It's probably easiest to, to undo them really fast, make sure there's nothing sure. hidden on them. Yeah, one of the reasons that we definitely want to make sure that we're not transporting water um, between different water bodies is the water can harbor larvae or villagers of aquatic invasive species. And so if you're transporting any water, you actually can be transporting the species. So what you want to make sure is just like in your pre-flight, that all the holds are pumped completely dry. And then if there's still any, any little bit of standing water in there, if possible, you can take a solution of bleach, bleach water, and we can spray it around in there, making sure that we're not getting it out into the lake water, but we can spray it around in there, and then that'll kill any possible lar larva that's hidden with a little bit of moisture or water that's in that. With flying boats, be sure to check and drain the hull to eliminate any standing water. One of the plugs are back here. Yes. Okay. So I'll have you loosen the plug just enough so we don't lose any water okay. uh, with the tool. Then as soon as you've got it so you can finger tighten it, we'll pull the tool out of the way. We'll okay. slide the bucket under and we don't want to lose any of the water. Okay. Most flying boats have a have drain plugs built into the keel. Okay. So when we come out of the water, we can take these out. If your aircraft must taxi through weed beds to reach open water, you will likely need to manually clear any new vegetation from the floats and rudders before takeoff. Do your best to avoid weed beds to minimize the risk and avoid having to clear the vegetation a second time. So always exercise caution when leaving the cockpit in open water. In the case of some types of amphibious aircraft, you may also need to cycle the wheels to clear any additional vegetation. Always cycle the rudders and wheels before leaving the dock. If you're unable to safely clear vegetation from the gear after taxiing through weeds, be sure to cycle again over the departing waterway or land and visually check to make sure that no vegetation remains attached before proceeding on to the next destination. These simple steps should become routine procedure when moving between uninfested waterways. However, the level of precaution required increases dramatically when flying into or out of any waterway known or suspected of having quagga or zebra mussels, or any critical plant species identified by local authorities. Starting in the spring of 2011, a list of these critical waters and species of concern, along with information on how to get a hold of the regulating agency, will be maintained on the websites of the National Seaplane Pilots Association and the 100th Meridian Initiative. When operating in critical waters, several additional steps may be required to supplement the pre-flight routine shown earlier. In some cases, you will need to perform these steps on your own. In others, the help of a trained inspector may be necessary. Always check the list of critical waters if you're uncertain whether the waterway you plan to fly into contains one of the critical invasive species. That way, you'll know what extra precautions will be required before leaving that waterway and can plan accordingly. If your amphibious aircraft must use one of these critical waterways, you may be required by the regulating authority to move the aircraft out of the water for inspection and, if needed, for a professional decontamination. Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, along with a lot of the other western states, uh -huh. are working on a program to get in touch with seaplane pilots and talk to them about not spreading aquatic invasive species, because uh, the planes can be vectors for these things. We want to come right back into where we had finished. All right. 
And uh, this is gonna be an area that you're really gonna wanna pay attention to. Here we have the, the right angles where all the rivets are. We have this opening in your strut and we got the petcock back in there. So this is a lot of area where you could get vegetation hooked up on. Okay. So make sure that when you're doing the inspection, you look back up in there, check and make sure that there's nothing hooked in there. Okay. And you want to also, besides looking, make sure you feel. Because okay. uh, in places, if you've been in water where there's been zebra or quagga mussels on it and they've, they've spawned, yeah. the villagers will settle on the surfaces and they'll actually feel like grit. They'll feel like a sand. Found something back here with your, uh, your wheel assembly. Remember where I was talking about the aquatic vegetation? Yeah, there's a good example. And here we have, we got some milfoil hanging up here. Have you ever found vegetation hooking on here before? I have seen it there before. Yeah, this would be a spot where it would normally collect. And okay. so now that we've found this, what I'd like to do today is um, offer to do a decontamination and show you how to actually clean the boat. We have some of the equipment here. Okay. Um, now if you didn't have decon equipment, the easiest way to do this is to physically remove your milfoil or any other aquatic vegetation and like you're here at the ramp here, you can take and throw it in a garbage can. Sounds good. Easy way to get rid of it. Okay. We're gonna leave this on for now and uh, we're going to then roll it up on onto the pad and we'll remove it there. In those cases where the regulating authority has implemented more stringent regulations for aircraft and where trained inspectors and decontamination facilities are available, you may be required to undergo a hot water pressure wash decontamination. The system shown here includes a containment boom to capture wastewater and debris from the decontamination process so that it cannot re-enter the waterway. It uses a portable temperature controlled pressure wash unit to achieve a temperature of 140 degrees Fahrenheit at the point of contact. Over 100 of these units are currently being used to decontaminate trailered watercraft and water-based equipment by federal, state, tribal, and local authorities throughout the western U.S. More than 25,000 decontaminations have been performed on private watercraft in the western U.S. over the past two years. One of the things we want you to do, Captain, is also... If your aircraft is not amphibious, you may still be required to undergo a detailed inspection and cleaning by a trained inspector at the dock. When inspection and cleaning services are not available at one of the critical waters, your best option is to make sure that all of your cleaning procedures have been completed thoroughly and consider taking some additional precautions, such as removing your aircraft from the water whenever practical to better facilitate self-inspection, draining, cleaning, repairing leaking floats of the hull, and drying. Adding a small amount of bleach solution Household bleach mixed one part bleach to five parts water to all aircraft compartments that could contain standing water, even if they have already been completely drained. Using a nearby alternative waterway for your activity whenever possible. And making a salt water landing after leaving a contaminated waterway and prior to landing in another freshwater system. Salt water will kill freshwater aquatic invasive species. Remember, by following these few simple steps to prevent the spread of harmful aquatic invasive species and cleaning your aircraft thoroughly, you not only protect the water resources that the nation depends on for water supply, recreation, power, and wildlife habitat, you also protect your access to public waterways. Do your part and help protect our vital waterways from this multi-billion dollar threat so now that you've watched the video, I'd like to introduce you to Harry Shannon from Amphibians Plus in Bartow, Florida. Harry's gonna show us how to prepare our float or in hauled amphibious aircraft so that we can use a mild bleach solution. That'll allow us to kill mussel larvae, especially that of quagga mussel, zebra mussels, Asian clams, mud snails, and other aquatic invasives. Before you use the bleach solution for the first time, we need to consider treating the insides of the floats to minimize the corrosive effect that the breakdown that our bleach solution can, can cause. The bleach solution, although one cup to a gallon, breaks down to salt and water at about 8% of what normal seawater is. By using these products, the uh, CRC, ACF50, Corrosion X, Shield, LPS3, or other products available to inhibit corrosion, we can minimize these effects over the long-term life of the floats. Properly applied to the interior of the float, 
we can, we can virtually stop the corrosive effects that our bleach solution is going to cause with the floats as time goes by. On an aluminum structure float, we want to be sure that all the skin laps and the keel area is properly coated with one of the, one of the mineral protectives that we uh, have used. Um, as you can see in this float, there's a tiny bit of water in the keel that should be shop vacked out so that we have a dry surface to uh, apply our corrosion inhibitor to to get proper penetration and protection of the materials. It's very important to note the structure of our float to include attach fittings. On the deck, we see these attach fittings externally, but we also have the other ends of those fittings internally. As well, we have fittings on our plumbing and we have electrical connections in here that need protection. None of this should be ignored when we're doing the treatment of the interior of the float or the hull. Well, thank you, Harry. I tell you what, after seeing the billions of dollars of damage that have been done by zebra mussels and quagga mussels in the Great Lakes, I'm sure convinced that we need to do everything we can to prevent the spread of these invasive species to other waterways that are not currently infected. Well, let's review what we've learned in this video. When we prepare to leave a body of water, remove any mud, plants, plant fragments, or animals from our seaplanes. Drain water from our floats only if it came from that body of water that we are on. Clean and dry anything that came in contact with the water, like dock lines and boots, and never release plants or animals into a body of water unless they came out of that body of water. When we taxi out for takeoff, we should avoid taxiing through weed beds, and if there are any weeds in the water, we should shut down in mid-lake and clean the water rudders of any plant fragments that may be on them. The water is clear on the way out. We cycle the water rudders up and down a couple of times to dislodge any plant fragments that we may have missed. And after takeoff, we again cycle the water rudders over the lake we have just departed from. We can kill mussels and other larvae by using a solution of one cup bleach to one gallon of water. And it's important not to mix this solution until we're ready to use it. It will lose its potency over time. 10 minutes of exposure to this solution will kill larvae. When available, 140 degree hot water can be used in lieu of the bleach solution, but the water must stay above 120 degrees for five minutes to kill the larvae. Determine if your destination water body has any reported invasive species and plan your flight accordingly. If your destination is a pristine lake or river, consider stopping at a land airport en route to do a complete inspection. Pump any excess water out of your floats or hull and kill any larvae. Wet dock lines should be soaked in the bleach solution for 10 minutes if the body of water you're leaving may have mussel larvae or spiny water flea. Information about the location of aquatic invasive species can be found on state and regional websites. A good place to start is protectyourwaters.net. Okay, we finished the review. Now let's take the exam. <laughs>